Good morning, everyone. My name is Jason Glassberg. I am a founder of Cassava Security, and I'm here to introduce Kurt Bailey to you this morning. Cassava Security is an information security firm with deep roots here in Seattle. And over the years, we've done many projects with the University of Washington under the tutelage of Kirk Bailey and his staff. In addition to sharing his years of experience with the city of Seattle and the University of Washington, perhaps Kirk's most potent contribution to the community has been the creation of the Agora. For those of you who don't know, the Agora, which means the marketplace in Greece, was created by Kirk to be a quarterly meeting of security professionals from the academic, government, and private sectors. The unique composition of this group allows for very interesting security discussions between public and private individuals. It has truly been a gift to the community, and we thank him very much for it. Without further ado, I'd like to present to you Mr. Kirk Bailey. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to kick things off with a remarkable story, which I'd like to um, have fun with. And then I want to offer some observations about my profession uh, that I think you might find interesting. Uh, I, I know that they are important to know about, the things I want to offer you. And then finally, I want to offer some uh, suggestions about duties with data that I'd like you to seriously consider. But even though that's the agenda of my talk, before I can do any of that, I'm, I'm obligated to uh, serve up a disclaimer with your morning coffee this morning. The University of Washington pays me to be their unmedicated paranoid, uh, to be on watch and on guard for any and all cyber threats that are out there. And I mean everything. That includes the, all the hackers, the Chinese, the Russians, the Iranians. It includes Anonymous, the zombie apocalypse. The Russians uh, are always there again. Frustrated imperson Elvis impersonators and uh, Justin Bieber fan club and <laughs> those impossible Yeti. Plus, not to mention the invading space aliens with their uh, facilities on the dark side of the moon. So for some reasons that aren't clear to me, the university doesn't want me speaking in public. Uh, I, I can, however, if I offer a disclaimer. So just so you know that any of the opinions I might offer today aren't necessarily those of my employer, the University of Washington, or any of its affiliated businesses. I know the Attorney General's office is very pleased to hear me say that. <laughs> so go figure all of that, but this discussion is now disclaimed. <clears throat> it's hard to share and talk about what I do and my profession. Uh, these days. It seems a bit unreal. It, it seems like something out of a movie. When I talk about needing to collaborate with the intelligence community, the Department of Defense, the Department of Commerce, uh, the Department of Energy, and uh, local and federal law enforcement, uh, folks tend to think that I'm obsessed with wanting to live in a Robert Ludlum book or something, um, or that my chakras might need to be realigned. I get a lot of varied responses. And when I mention cyber espionage, organized crime, when I mention nation state sponsored uh, uh, attacks and political hacktivism, management folks sort of wonder if I've uh, worn my, my uh, uh, work day too long and I maybe need to take a little bit of a break and relax and get sort of a hold of myself. So because of that, I've discovered early on in my career that uh, the best ways to communicate about my world, about my world, is just talk in metaphors and stories that help reduce the skepticism and the dismissive responses I often get from folks. So, with that in mind, that's the reason why um, I'm telling you this story, so that the, the real realities that I want to share with you might be a bit more palatable. This is a true story and one of my favorites. <clears throat> Beginning in the winter of 1988 and 89, a nightmare began for the Burlington Northern Railroad. During a five-week period of time, three massive freight trains dera derailed in almost the exact same location, uh, just south of uh, Glacier National Park in the Marias Pass area of Montana where the great Burlington Northern Railroad lines cross the Continental Divide in the Rocky Mountains at an elevation of 5,213 feet. It's a remote and beautiful area. We're talking about rugged and gorgeous country, Jeremiah Johnson type country. You folks might remember this 1972 Sidney Pollack movie with uh, Robert Redford. Uh, at any rate, it's as beautiful as that movie portrays. Uh, and the park and its immediate surroundings, Glacier National Park's immediate surroundings in the Marais Pass area is a pristine, gorgeous place, and it's a sanctuary for an incredible menagerie of wildlife. Scatologists, animal trackers, and bird watchers uh, can hone their skills and, um, and pursue their interests in just wonderful fashion up there. Uh, moose, deer, elk, they're all there, mountain lion, bighorn sheep, lynx, uh, badger, black bear, marmot, raccoon, porcupine, squirrel, coyote, wolverine, and wolf all make their home there. 
uh, an amazing am array of birds, and most importantly, it's the uh, larger, it has the largest surviving population of the great American grizzly bear uh, in the continental United States, still living there. Uh, so it was in the dead of winter in this area, with all the critters in this gorgeous countryside, uh, with winter um, taking hold with howling winds, blizzard-like conditions, sub-zero temperatures, that the last of the three freight trains uh, uh, lost control and tumbled off the tracks just east of Marias Pass. 52 railroad grain cars, 52 railroad grain cars thundered and tumbled off the track and spilled down the steep mountain slopes, um, spilling all their cargo, grain corn, tons of grain corn, 100 tons per railroad car. Uh, and coincidentally, the two previous trains that had wrecked in the same area were also uh, grain trains carrying grain corn. The amount of grain corn spilled by those three train wrecks in that immediate area was an enormous amount, between 20 and 30 million pounds, upwards of 15,000 tons of grain corn. Literally, uh, uh, new Rocky Mountain foothills, foothills had been created made out of corn. <clears throat> Well, in the dead of winter, of course, with howling winds and sub-zero temperatures and in a remote Rocky Mountain location, it's not easy for a company to stage a response to big, messy train wrecks. About all the railroad could do was clear the tracks and use their um, very heavy rail cranes to fetch and retrieve as many of the spilled railroad cars as they could, and that was about it. There clearly was no opportunity or ability for them to clean up the corn. The railroad decided to wait until uh, the spring thaw to even begin to tackle the problem. And when the spring of 1989 finally came around, reality finally struck home to the Burlington Northern Railroad and all their plans and all their good intentions to clean up the corn. When the snow was melting away and before the railroad could uh, muster its response, the bears woke up in the mountains. And they woke up very hungry from their long, long winter's nap. And they walked outside their dens, they stretched, they sniffed the air and tilted their big old heads and wondered if they had died and gone to heaven. <laughs> First indications there might have been a developing problem came from railroad engineers driving the trains over the pass who were starting to report large numbers of grizzly bears hanging around the track. Um, that was immediately reported, was, was followed up with uh, phone calls from the Forest Service District Rangers warning the railroad that the massive corn spills had become a very dangerous, attractive nuisance. Large numbers of uh, dangerous and unpredictable grizzly bears were congregating eating the corn and not leaving. They were eating, so they were full, flopping down on top of the huge piles of corn, sleeping <laughs> until they were quite sated and digested, and then they would get back up and they would eat more, wash, rinse, repeat, you know, gorge, sleep, eat. It was a terrible problem. Forest Service, of course, was very concerned about the safety of the bears being in such close proximity to railroad tracks. Bears, after all, the grizzly bears in particular, are an endangered species. And one bear cub had already been killed. Burlington Northern officials began to uh, get worried and concerned because their best estimate, their best estimate for the cleanup, as opposed to the immediacy wanted by the U.S. Forest Service, was it would take two full years to clean up the grain corn. Two full years. Imagine bears sleeping on piles of corn for two full years. <laughs> it's not the zoo. Uh, then the railroad uh, got a phone call from the Mont Montana State Highway Patrol. As it turns out, the state's scenic Highway 2 in the Marias Pass area runs parallel to the railroad tracks for a few miles. And as it happens, one of the, uh, at one point it curves within about 100 yards of an unobstructed view of the train wreck site, the corn hills, and all the bears. Well, the state patrol was concerned because people were pulling over, parking their cars, watching the incredible spectacle. Not only were they parking their cars, they were even blocking traffic on occasions on the highway, and they were yanking out cameras, blankets, binoculars, picnic baskets, and their children. They all seemed oblivious to the extraordinary hazards they were causing for the folks trying to drive the highway and the extraordinary danger they were exposing themselves and their families to uh, with the unpredictable uh, grizzly bears, the close proximity to them. Over the next several weeks, the calls from the Forest Service and the Montana State Patrol grew more frequent and urgent in nature. The area was turning into an around-the-clock, ever-growing, extremely dangerous interspecies wilderness hoedown, and the Burlington Northern Railroad didn't know quite what to do about it. Worse, the black bears had begun to uh, test the grizzlies' moods and discovered that they could hang out and feast on the food, too. Apparently, the grizzlies, the grizzlies thought there was plenty enough to go around. And the black bears were also pleased and delighted to find growing piles of garbage left by the growing piles of tourists and locals who were ignoring all the new signage being put up by the Montana State Highway Patrol. No stopping, no parking, no littering, area off limits, danger bears, don't get out of cars. Of course, as always, the Montana State Highway Patrol and other highway patrols fail to recognize people can't read. <laughs> by the way, the State Patrol was also beginning to send their bills to the 
Burlington Northern Railroad for all the new signage that wasn't being read and for all the extra costs trying to facilitate the traffic problems and try to protect people up in uh, Highway 2 on Marias Pass. Burlington R Northern Railroad now knew clearly that the train wreck residues had turned into both a public safety and a wildlife habitat problem of considerable size and potential liabilities. I'm glad I wasn't the person in charge. While they were working hard to try and clean up the massive corn mess, their efforts were hampered constantly, of course, by the growing persistent presence of wildlife, which now included deer, elk, mice, rats, marmots, and a wide variety of birds, and an occasional moose or two, besides all the bears. And of course, all the critters and all the railroad workers working hard to try and clean up this terrible problem had to keep a very watchful eye on the very large, unpredictable, moody grizzly bears. Uh, as problematic as, as that was, uh, it began to get worse because of the summer. The whole problem got worse because an increasing volume of beer and wine that the law-breaking tourists and locals were bringing along with them to help enhance the pleasure they're consorting with nature were being consumed in large amounts. As problematic as things were with that, conditions and problems were going to get considerably more dangerous and difficult for everyone. It was all because of the sunshine and the extra warm summer. The corn began to cook. The whole sunny day thing, combined with the enormous weight and volume of the corn, caused the whole thing to start cooking down and fermenting. <laughs> essentially, essentially, Burlington Northern now was responsible for cleaning up the world's largest corn liquor you know, uh, production site. <laughs> Forest rangers made it clear that it was a serious problem for all of that wildlife in the area. The really bad news, the seriously bad news, was that the giant grizzly bears really liked it. <laughs> The insane situation now included intoxicated bears in very close proximity to intoxicated people. Bears could be killed by trains, people could be killed by bears, and the Burlington Northern Railroad was getting killed by bad publicity, bad press, and growing financial liabilities. It's a nightmare. It was reality. Burlington Northern realized it had to do uh, some drastic things to try and uh, avoid more calamities. They didn't want anybody to get hurt. Uh, any more bears to get killed, and, and they didn't want any of the foolish people out in Highway 2 to become so much finger food for the uh, bears' new perpetual happy hour. <laughs> they decided to do two dramatic things. The first thing they decided to do is to spend a fortune uh, and, and, and an aggressive effort bringing in all kinds of help to enclose some of the rail lines to do an immediate giant cleanup of the closest piles of corn, the easiest ones to clean up, to see if they could at least get rid of that. They also decided the second part of that plan was to build a very expensive 9600 volt electric fence down and around several acres of spilled corn in very difficult terrain to try and contain wildlife from getting to it. By the middle of the fall, that fall, they had actually managed to complete both of those tasks at considerable cost and struggle. Few injuries to workers trying to navigate the hillside, but it was all done without loss of life. The good news was that the fence seemed to work just a little bit better than they had hoped. There were the birds getting in, there were small critters getting in, but by and large the bears were kept from the, uh, the remaining residual piles of corn. The bad news was that they were still milling in the area and three more grizzly bears were killed along with assorted uh, other several furry critters and birds. You'd think that would be the end of the story, but it wasn't. The problems lingered for years. The next spring, the bears were back in hungry numbers, um, looking for easy dining. The rotting corn inside the fenced area was producing a rich, sticky, sweet smell that could not be controlled. It would attract wildlife of all types for the next three years. Also, wildlife biologists warned Burlington Northern Railroad the problem wasn't going to go away because bears had long memories when it came to food. The grizzlies uh, were likely going to, have to, were going to keep coming back through their entire lifespan. Now, the average lifespan of a grizzly is 25 years. That means the cubs that wandered over to those big piles of corn in 1989 would likely be coming back until 2015, and they still do. North, uh, Burlington Northern Railroad still pays hefty money for mitigation controls for dangers associated with the bears at Mariah's Pass. Their liabilities continue. One other unanticipated result of the great uh, corn incident all that scat from all the furry critters and all the birds that feasted on that 1989 spill, it did its job. That poop did a remarkable job. To this day, uh, the district rangers up in the area report finding uh, uh, large amounts of random stalks of corn growing in the area. Well, the point I wanted to make about this story isn't that grizzly bears like corn liquor. Uh, <laughs> although that's a pretty good, pretty thing, good thing to know. Um, the point of me of telling this story has to do with the harsh reality of not understanding potential consequences. Way too often, all of us, business leaders and excited people with business plans, 
um, focus on their ambitions, their ideas and plans out of the context of reality. And that's okay, it's a good thing, it's good for inspiration, but people are reluctant to want to weigh potential negatives or try and anticipate it unanticipated consequences that can unfold. It's not an unreasonable thing to try on for size. I witness this every day at the university when I'm asked to intercede in contract negotiations with vendors who want to sell some new software, some new wonder electronic gadget or some new service to the university and its community. Um, those vendors don't want me in the room because they don't want me asking the hard questions and talking about potential unintended consequences. Liability, uh, all the kinds of things that, that might mean more responsibilities to them and accountability is not a favored conversation. The important lesson of this story is the reality that I alluded to being the ultimate trump card. Uh, it chews up bad assumptions. It, it doesn't give a damn about laws and rules. It doesn't care what time it is. It, it, it feasts on good intentions and fools and reality loves people who are in denial. Um, and here's my segue to those professional observations I want to share with you. This is where my paranoia kicks in. Just be aware. Put your anxiety deflectors up. <laughs> Reality can really clobber really good plans. And all of you got great plans with data and real interest in data. And especially when it comes to the mountains of data folks you, work, you, you, you folks use and, and have on mind to, to incorporate into your business, to me, all that data out there, all that data you want in your professional world, like I said, all that data you believe you need to have, all that data you want for predictive analytics, all that data you want for targeted marketing campaigns, all that data you want your fingertips 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I'll tell you all that data looks like, to me, so many piles of grain corn. Uh, it looks like huge piles of ugly, unintended consequences that my profession will have to help deal with if, if, uh, if, if it spills into the ugly downside of cyberspace. I'll have to be there to investigate and mitigate liabilities that are associated with it. And, and data is far more toxic and interesting than, uh, than grain corn. Data is such odd stuff. I encourage all of you to think about data differently. It isn't just an opportunity to get information. It is volatile stuff. It's way more interesting than mercury or silly putty. It's remarkable. It can hurt people, and it can be saving for people. It can drive factory production or drive people nuts. It can provide uh, accurate navigation or it can get you lost. It can help you with your online banking transactions or it can rob you blind. Uh, it can be accurate or it can be corrupted. Uh, it can be for everyone or it can be private and confidential. Uh, it's also turned into a powerful fuel for the new economy, so it's become incredibly valuable. As a result, data has become a target, the target, for just about every mischief maker, miscreant, opportunist, creep, criminal, and spy on the planet. If you think the menagerie of critters at Mariah's Pass feasting on the corn was something, you ought to see what I see out in cyberspace feasting on data. It's a remarkable menagerie of people. From a cybersecurity and privacy perspective, we've gotten uh, ourselves into a very serious pickle. Um, the technology uh, marketplace is cheaper, faster, uh, power, more powerful, more convenient than it ever has been before. The, the consumerization of technology is a huge headache for all of us technology professionals. Humanity is going bored, dripping themselves with technology tools, and man, oh man, people love that stuff. They just, they, they, they just crave having that convenience in their hands, and I don't blame them. It's pretty remarkable. I just can't believe how fast and foolish information technology is evolving and how consumers' behavior is shaped by it so randomly, um, and Lordy, it's getting way, way out of hand, um, or, or in hand, as the case may be. You now out there seem to have four technology religions. Uh, the proselytizers and marketers of those religions are seeking converts through manipulation in cyberspace and Super Bowl commercials. You got hordes of devoted Appleites, you got your Googleites, you got your Microsofties, and you got your Amazonians. And each one of those different religions have their cool new proprietary devices, their products, their apps, and all their branded cyberspace services, all with designs to profile their devoted users. And those people seem to give up their privacy like it was so much tithing. Uh, for the technology enthused, no matter their technology religion, uh, the evolving information age uh, appears to them like it's a luxury bullet train shooting down the track uh, at an ultimate destination to some techno nirvana, uh, a place for total convenience and complete command of your personal and professional lives. To cybersecurity professionals and the, and the privacy experts I work with, all of it looks a little like a slow motion train wreck to us. Um, why would I say that? Why, why a killjoy? Well, first of all, remember, I'm unmedicated. Um, well, not to put too fine a point on it, um, the security of the data and the privacy it represents has gone to hell in a handbasket. Uh, I can honestly tell you that things are so challenging right now. A professional with 25 years' experience in the field in a variety of industries, I have to tell you, it's never been more challenging, and I'm uh, very concerned that I have the ability to, to service the demands of the institution I work for in terms of 
quality protection of data. It's gotten quite, quite bad. I don't know if you've been watching and reading the news lately, um, and in the last few years, uh, I can't believe how many people have missed some of the stories that are out there, but it's crazy unnerving, many of the things that are happening in cyberspace. Here are some of those tough realities for you to sort of chew on for a minute. Let's start with the uh, extensive compromises of U.S. media, just been announced in the last few weeks. Folks must be aware of these. We're talking about the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Bloomberg News, and CNN. All have disclosed discovery of extensive, long-duration, well-planned cyber attacks uh, run against them by other countries. We're talking about one of, the, one of the legs of our democracy, one of the foundations of our society, and that's a free press, media. It's been deliberately targeted, compromised by people seeking to harm U.S. citizens' uh, economic and political interests. I don't know if that bothers you, but it's a little alarming to me. I was very grateful for the news media giants to come forward with these particular breaches. It's good to know about them. Then there are the banks. I don't know if you're aware of this, but even this morning, some of the banks have been under attack. Uh, since October of last year, many of the major U.S. banks and dozens of smaller ones and credit unions have been struggling to defend against distributed denial of service attacks designed and launched to disrupt online banking services uh, against the United States and its citizens. Senior officials and security experts, and myself included, have stated that Iran is behind them. Um, it's been in the news, and it continues today includes Bank of America, Citibank, J.P. Morgan Chase, HSBC, U.S. Bank, Third, uh, Fifth Third Bank, Wells Fargo, and many, many more. All of them, if you can look it up right now on the internet, just look up bank attacks. They're ongoing and they're deliberate. The purpose is to make a point about U.S. comforts in their lives, in our lives. And what about all the alarming glimpses we get of the growing undeclared cyber war between Israel, the United States, and its allies, uh, uh, between, and Iran, um, it's, it's been in the news for the last couple of years, you all probably remember Stuxnet, but in the last couple of months security experts have become quite alarmed because there's been an escalation of the warfare. Um, in July and August, uh, security experts announced that Iran has successfully launched strategically targeted disruption attacks at Israel, the United States, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar. In July it was the Mahdi malware. The Mahdi malware was unleashed like a cyber ballistic missile caused serious disruptions and theft of data in the U.S. and Israeli companies and in diplomatic offices in several parts of the world. In August, the Shamoon malware hit the Saudi Aramco oil company. Uh, that's the biggest company in the world, by the way. It makes Enron and Apple look like pikers. The estimated asset value of Saudi Arabia, Saudi Aramco, is $7 trillion. It also hit Qatar's Raz Gas Corporation, the world's uh, second largest producer of liquid natural gas. To most experts, these attacks appeared to, have, appeared to be a response in kind to the Stuxnet and flame malware attacks that were launched against Iran, uh, designed to disrupt their um, efforts to produce nuclear weapons. The reason the two Middle East uh, gas and oil giants were targeted was because Iran's leadership was furious with both Saudi Arabia and Qatar for declaring support for the international economic sanctions that were imposed on them. Damage caused by the Shamoon malware was extensive and alarming. Many of us, when we first heard about it, couldn't believe it. I'm, I'm, I know personally several of the security experts who flew to the Middle East to support the review of what happened. Um, they uh, have openly reported that at least 30,000 computers were compromised and damaged by the malicious code and had to be replaced. 30,000 computers in one fell swoop. Razgas has not been as forthcoming with their damage reports, but we do know that their production of liquid natural gas was disrupted long enough to cause a serious problem for one of their major customers, South Korea, who experienced a bit of an energy shortage. Korea depends heavily on liquid natural gas, um, that Raz and Razgas is their primary provider. Then there's last week's State of the Union speech. You must have heard the president say that he had just issued a new executive order to initiate activities and, and actions that would help the United States fortify itself against threats to its critical infrastructure. He said that the power grids, the banks, our water supply systems, our sewage pumping systems, our traffic control systems, our retail marketing efforts, those kinds of things were vulnerable to attack. And he issued new executive orders, orders to try and help turn around our vulnerabilities on those. Then there were the startling comments by uh, four-star general Keith Alexander. I don't know if all of you know who he is. He's the director of the National Security Agency, and he's the uh, uh, head of the Pentagon Cyber Command. He's the chief cyber defender for the U.S. He recently stated in a speech uh, two months ago uh, that he believed, the U.S. government believed, and he believed that the illicit cyberspace activities that have been targeting the United States in 2012 alone 
essentially amounted to the greatest transfer of wealth in history. Uh, speaking to the uh, American Enterprise Institute, Institute, a conservative think tank, he said that U.S. companies have been losing as an estimated $250 billion to uh, a half trillion dollars because of intellectual property theft and financial fraud. Loss of our intellectual capital to those who want to steal data, munch on grain corn. McAfee, the computer software uh, and security company, put the number for last year's losses at $1 trillion globally for remediation efforts and losses to cyber attacks. Then there's a really ugly evolving problem in a growing number of small to medium-sized businesses falling prey to organized crime. Um, they're the perfect targets. They're underfunded. They tend, a lot of them who are franchise owners don't have a lot of capital. So what falls by the wayside often is uh, security controls and measures to protect their online services or their credit card processing services. Starting in 2011, going through 2012, a record number of, and growing number of small businesses, medium-sized businesses, have been targeted very effectively. I've had to respond myself to some friends who own small businesses. It's, it's alarming how effective those attacks can be and how disruptive for the small business person it can be. And then there's, an, there's my world at the University of Washington. During the last year, we have been getting clobbered by effective, disruptive, targeted phishing attacks and had devices on our networks turned and used against other organizations after they were compromised. This happens on a regular basis. Uh, we deflected some several million uh, cyber attacks last year through our intrusion prevention systems. Protecting UW information assets is a constant growing challenge. It's very real. Data is valuable. You probably know that better than anybody. Data is extraordinarily valuable. So besides good people wanting it, bad people want it. So in the middle of this security crisis that I just outlined in my unmedicated state, deflect your shields up, um, all you good folks are working very hard to ride the big data and the technology bullet train into an important new future for your organization. You want to be profitable. You want to do well. You want to serve your community and clients well. And you know what? That's exactly what you need to do. Um, Everyone in my business wants you to be wildly successful. Uh, believe me, we really do. Um, so what to do with all this stuff that I've laid out and thumped on on the podium today? What, what to do with the problems? Well, I have some simple suggestions that don't cost a lot of money. That's one of the things I've had to grapple at is, um, you know, I can give you a stack of standards from NIST that you have to do. I can give you federal standards. I can give you compliance controls. I can give you checklist after checklist of technology solutions you can try and implement, but it won't make any difference. If an adversary is interested in getting the grain corn, they will get the grain corn. They attack through people, people and their seven deadly sins, their vanity, their avarice. It's easy to seduce and socialize, uh, socially manipulate people. There's not much you can do. So instead of all of that, I have simple suggestions. Here they are. One, make your brand synonymous with responsible and thoughtful data use. You folks are some of the, the, the biggest consumers of personally identifiable data. Some of you are likely custodians of my data. Uh, please do us all a huge favor and think about becoming your community's facilitator or even the leader in badly needed discussions about privacy in the information age. It's largely ignored. There is not a lot of conversation uh, for people to go to to talk about the concerns for privacy and how to navigate those privacy waters for successful business. Um, Host public meetings if you dare. Do things like this. Host meetings where the discussion could be had and talk about tough issues about opt-in or opt-out and the, the, the consequences financially of that or business-wise for that. And take the best of the information from those discussions and bring them back to your business decision-making processes. Become a, 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 a recognized protector of data privacy with your brand. And you know, I think you should probably think about doing it anyway, even though it may sound a bit too much, because the truth is federal legislation is probably coming your way pretty soon where they're going to ask you to do that anyway. So think about privacy as a, as a virtue and a powerful business tool. Second, learn, to, this is one of the most important ones. This is one of the most important ones. Learn to use only the data you need and no more. And replicate it as little as possible. Keep the electronic footprint of your data as small as possible. You know, we, we're, we're captured by the allure of the convenience of technology. And I can't tell you how many times I've gone into business units and I have found laying around in a consulting basis lots of unnecessary piles of data that isn't being used anymore. If it isn't being used, delete it, get rid of it. Don't make it a, a, an interesting and easy pile for unwelcomed eyes. Third, don't let your staff randomly and casually spread access to data, spread their access to data. Lap, lost laptops, compromised home computers, Compromised smart devices, lost smart devices are, are a huge problem 
are just a huge problem. Make sure to honestly evaluate whether your staff needs to access sensitive data all the time from anywhere. I mean, if it's necessary, that's fine. But this technology is making all of us lazy about, thoughtful, about being thoughtful with other people's data. Convenience isn't necessarily a reason to create unnecessary greater risk for other people's data. Be mindful of that. Um, if you can take care of the business at work and keep the data limited to a scoped area, that'd be great. Being able to transport it, share it, file it, and have it compromised in your personal life is not a good thing. Fourth, make sure you have a clear and strong data sharing agreement and contract uh, terms in place with all the businesses and business partners and vendors you have, especially the ones you share data with. When others handle your data, make them accountable. Define where data protection liabilities and responsibilities start and stop. Um, with all the parties involved. Define what security controls might be appropriate and expected. And, and make sure you understand the limits of liability and, 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 and have those written out. Now these conversations are very hard. At the university we've had several tough questions and conversations about vendors in relation to negotiating these kinds of terms. But I can tell you what, it always is worth it in the end because what's left is a clear picture of business partners knowing where things start and stop, what, where, the, where the lines of demarcation are. And it's very healthy. And it's not unreasonable. The last thing I'd like to suggest um, is that you become best pals with your cybersecurity professional. It's not that I'm lonely and looking for friends, but um, if they're really good at their job, if a cybersecurity professional is really good at their job, they can actually be of huge value to your organization. And, and if you engage them and work with them to forge sensible and practical and effective uh, data protection programs, um, everyone benefits by it. And if you don't have a cybersecurity program or a professional in place, Jiminy Christmas, afford one or create one. Get at least one expert in there helping you understand and learn about your data exposures and your data issues. It's very important and very worthwhile. And I guarantee you that if they become inhibitors, if they become detractors from your business, you can give them my phone number and have them call me and I will straighten them out. They are supposed to be there to enable your business. Well, those are all the words of wisdom I had specifically to uh, all the paranoia I spread and the responses I like to have, but I have one last comment I'd like to share with you, one last tip, and this is an important one. Uh, speaking as the unofficial, unmedicated paranoid for the University of Washington, I'm sure that some of my paranoia might have rubbed off on you and you, some of those de anxiety deflector shields failed. And since they did, I have some considerable experience in understanding how to cope with those anxieties. Now, I do not recommend the expensive mood mod behind be behavior modifying drugs. They're, they're expensive, nasty, very, very nasty side effects. Do not use those. Instead, I suggest a much more pleasant, cheaper alternative, um, a good, delicious single malt scotch. <laughs> An 18-year-old McCallum's is just heaven, and it's uh, luxurious and so smooth. It's a bit pricey at 150 bucks a bottle, but it's worth it plenty of doses in that particular bottle. <laughs> now, if you want a slightly less expensive uh, explosion of comfort, warmth, and wonderful flavors, I suggest a 10-year-old Laphroaig. It's powerful medicine for cyber anxieties. I have lots of first-hand experience with 10-year-old Laphroaig. The Laphroaig is a subtly rich, with deep, smoky, earthy, peaty flavors. Let me go on. Uh, <laughs> The Scots over there on the Isle of Ely uh, dig deep into the bogs to get the ancient peat that's really close to the dinosaurs. And, and when they use its smoke to flavor the grain for their wonderful elixir, it creates uh, scotch like nothing else. It drenches your taste buds with delicious and rich smoky luxury with just a faint spicy nip of T-Rex. It's perfect. <laughs> Well, I tell you what, if I'm around at the end of the day, I say those of you who are still troubling, uh, struggling with your anxieties that I may have created, I'm willing to walk up town with you and look for some of that wonderful Isle of Ely mixture uh, for, our, for our pleasure. And we can savor it over uh, you know, the pending Cybergeddon and all the space aliens on the dark side of the moon. And if you don't like scotch, I think I know where I can get you some corn liquor. <laughs> so thank you very much. If you have any questions, I, I was told I could ask for those if you wanted them. Really, the scotch. <laughs> the scotch. Yeah. China or Iran a bigger threat? Well, that's a great question. Um, uh, this is just my humble opinion. Uh, the world is a much bigger place than my little mind. Uh, China represents a different threat than Iran. Iran is an extraordinary adversary at this point. 
It has chosen to be an adversary. It, it, it has sought blessing from the Ayatollah. All those who are conscripted into the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard, that's, that's, that's actually acting as the cyber militia for the nation state of Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran, um, have been blessed and they believe they're acting in God's good graces, um, as opposed to US uh, soldiers who don't seek the blessings of their priests. They are very, very uh, acute in their interests of causing harm to the US and their allies. Um, so the problem with Iran, however, uh, modest they are in, in terms of size and scope of their cyber capabilities, are not afraid to direct it in, in any, uh, without limitation. They represent a significant problem. I keep a very strong watch on the Iranian presence on our networks, uh, just in case um, it is malicious in intent. China, China, China's been at this for a decade. They're a, they're a, in, in my world, China, the, 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 name a nation state, ladies and gentlemen. You know, there's 72 countries out there that have active cyber warfare programs being developed by their militaries. This is a, a new age we're living in. Um, China, Russia, um, Brazil, Bol <laughs> Bolivia, it's true, Romania, all these countries have intent on taking the riches of the United States and disrupting your businesses or using your businesses. In terms of China, they're extraordinary in their capability. I have no doubt that a big chunk of that half trillion dollars in intellectual property loss, a good chunk of it went to China. Any other questions? Can you speak to how you know, the University of Washington Advancement Office has worked closely with your office in sort of addressing some of these? Absolutely. Um, actually, Advancement Office, Walt Dreyfus and his team, Chris Sorensen, all these good folks who work in advancement, have been a delight for me. First of all, I came in a little bit uh, aggressive as a security professional, um, not realizing the extraordinarily interesting and powerful culture of the university. And Walt Dreyfus took me aside damn near the first day and welcomed me into that environment and has been a, a, a wonderful coach in helping me understand the challenges he has and the things I might be able to help him with. And that guidance has been wonderful for me. It's laid the groundwork for other relationships. So first of all, advancement had helped me a bunch, just a bunch, and I appreciate it. Um, in terms of watching advancement respond has been wonderful. Um, they, have, they have business needs. They got stuff they got to get done, and they're doing it wisely. Um, one of the first things Walt said is, okay, if I don't need social security numbers, I'm getting rid of them. You know, and the reason you want to do that is if you're going to go to reputational loss, the idea of losing social security numbers puts you right underneath Washington state law where you have to make notification. So you're, you're stuck by law to have to give notification as opposed to institutional value. So Walt's very thoughtfully thought about that. When it came to, comes to the, 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 the integration of my opportunities of working with them, they invited me into their leadership meetings for a long period of time, uh, their operational meetings. Uh, they allowed me to share my paranoia and, and listen and learn. When it came to their, one of their products they're developing now, they allowed me to recommend them paying money to hire some experts. Jason, who came up and introduced me. Um, and they accepted and worked with him, and I think they found benefit. It, and there's a wonderful open door there that is just delicious. So I salute the University of Washington Advancement for their strong and, and welcomed interest in cybersecurity. It's, it's benefited us a lot, both sides. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, there's no one answer. Every security question turns out, there's no one size fits all. In order for me to answer you correctly, I'd have to look at your specific personal or business situation. Um, the needs and the immediacy of the data access may be different. I can tell you that if you have lots of data you don't need and you think you might need it, it's best to store in a secure fashion. Uh, if, if you only need it randomly and not from anywhere, anytime, maybe you should make sure it's not connected to the internet. If you can't encrypt it, maybe you need to make sure it's safely stored to preserve its integrity and its future availability. The answer is not crisp or easy to understand. I do know that um, network intruders now are getting very good at being able to sniff out the locations of those huge piles of corn on networks by behavioral analysis. These guys are very good at what they do. They can tell me where my firewalls are, where my filtration systems are, my, my passive and, and in place filters are. They can do it by extraordinarily interesting timing network analysis. These guys are good. These individuals who want to steal that data are good. So disconnecting them from the network, if that's what you can do, would be a good thing. I probably can't be done, but if you can think about it, it'd be good. 
Is that about it? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Kirk. It was uh, frightening and enlightening and definitely entertaining this morning. So thank you. And the rest of you guys have a great conference this afternoon.